when you look at me, what do you see? Because for most people, usually a single word comes to mind. Now, I've been using crutches for around 16 years, but I didn't always. And although I was born with a vein problem that affects my left leg, it only got worse around the age of 10 when I started using them. And I remember on a month after I started using them, there was a field trip. And we sat on the school bus, we were all teasing each other. And at one point, I jumped in and I made a joke about one of the other kids, who immediately turned around and said, shut up, cripple. I think this was the first time that I began to identify as being disabled. And it didn't really feel like a good thing. And after this moment, I went to a sort of denial about my disability. I mean, I literally wouldn't even acknowledge the fact that I was on crutches. But neither did anyone else. It was like an unspoken rule at my school. But without hardship, there can be nothing to survive. So I feel like sometimes you need these moments of adversity in life in order to grow. Fast forward a couple of years, and I'm about to start university. Now, I heard all these stories about people reinventing themselves at uni. You know, you could be anyone you wanted to be. And I knew I wanted a new identity. I was done being the disabled kid, the kid on crutches. Except I was still on crutches. <laughs> and so the first thing that most people would ask me was, hey, dude, what happened to your leg? So I could no longer just ignore it. And I began spinning an elaborate web of lies. And on any given day throughout my degree, I could have injured it skiing, stunt driving, shark cage diving, or my personal favorite was playing for Chelsea FC. <laughs> I was a striker. <laughs> But the problem with lying about myself every single day to every single person was that it started to eat me up a little bit inside. And I developed this anxiety that surrounded my disability in my leg. And I was in this downward spiral of lying to cover my disability, feeling bad about myself because I had lied, and then lying more because I blamed those bad feelings on my leg. It all became very messy. And I decided to go see a counselor. And for the first time in my life, I began talking about my leg and my disability. And after a couple of years of this, I felt like I was ready to come clean. And when people would ask me, I would, I would, I would tell them that I have a disability. I would use the D word. And this was a huge step for me. And I really felt like I was taking control of my life. And I began to accept the person that I really was. And so I was feeling a little bit better about myself at this point, And I decided to explore the idea, or the idea of amputation. Scary, I know, but maybe get a blade, a carbon fiber blade. Now, I soon became obsessed with this idea, and I was planning my Halloween costumes for the next three years running. I was gonna be, was gonna be a pirate with a peg leg on the first year and a terminator the second. Unfortunately, due to my condition, amputation wasn't a possibility. Too bad for Halloween. <laughs> but my doctor said something that day that stuck with me. Amputation or not, I would likely never run or walk again normally, and that I would never be an athlete. It was at this very moment that I realized that the biggest challenge I faced growing up as a kid on crutches wasn't my leg or the fact that I couldn't walk. It was society's perceptions of me and what I was capable of. People's perceptions are usually based on the first thing that they see. And for me, that's usually my crutches which means they see my disability before they see me, and thus think about what I can't do before they think about what I can do. Now, six years later, I was coming to the end of my degree, and for the first time in my life, I had a real choice of path. You know, I could go back to studying architecture, listen to my doctor, continue to live in spite of hardship, or thrive. And so I graduated for my master's degree in architecture about two years ago now, and I drew a line under it. No pun intended. <laughs> I think it all came to a head. Everything I had experienced, every person that told me what I couldn't do, every lie I had told, it was like a timer had been set. That moment I got on that school bus a kid with crutches, and it had just gone off. I felt the need to show everyone, to show myself what I was capable of and what I could do. So I signed up for a 15-kilometer Spartan race. I trained harder than I'd ever trained before in my entire life, and I was so, I, I wanted it bad, but I was so scared. Scared of one thing in particular, and that was, I was afraid of making a fool of myself, and scared of becoming my disability, and all the labels and stereotypes that went with it. But 15 kilometers later, in a little bit of mud, I finished the Spartan race, middle of the pack, 
a sub five hour time, mind you, but who's counting, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did five races that year. And fitness, the one thing that had separated me from everyone else as a kid and highlighted my differences, now became a way of me taking control of my body again. Now became a way of me redefining what was possible living with a disability. And I really thought of myself as an athlete at this point, and I really identified with my disability, but not as a disabled athlete, not as a not abled athlete, as an adaptive athlete. I would only have used the word adaptive because that's what I was, different, not less. And so I decided to go to the sports health check to make sure my heart was okay, to be running and training for all of these races. And during the sports health check, my doctor asked me what sport I did, different doctor. And so, you know, I was pretty pleased with myself at the time. I was like, I do these races on my crutches. And there was a pause. And he turned to me and he said, well, that's not really a sport, is it? And <laughs> to have spent so much time and emotional energy coming to terms with myself and identifying as an adaptive athlete, I was gutted hearing this. And I saw it at the time as a massive blow to my confidence and my ambitions of being a sportsman. When in fact, what I couldn't see, I guess, it was just the stimulus that I needed to grow. So I sat down with my laptop that night and I went through every single Paralympic sport on the list. I was determined to have a sport and be seen as an athlete. Until I came across wheelchair fencing. I'd always liked swords as a kid, and this was pretty much good enough for me at the time. I was getting pretty desperate at this point. <laughs> so I threw myself at it. I wanted it bad. And five months later, I was selected for Team GB. Now, a year and a bit down the line, I've done seven World Cups, a European Championships, I've taken a bronze individual medal and a team silver at World Cup level. Last year in November, I was ranked 18th and 20th in the world across my two weapons. And despite all that, I still get people telling me that I'm crazy for quitting my career to do this and that I'll regret it one day. Maybe, but that's a chance I'll take. Now, how many of you have ever asked yourself what ideas or what talents that you have that the world never saw because you were too scared to take a chance on yourself? That book you never wrote, or that voice we never heard, or your leadership we never saw. Taking responsibility for our lives is not an easy thing. It's much easier to blame our disability or adversity on the things we can't or won't do. But when we stop seeing that disability or adversity as something that's holding us back, and when we start seeing it as just another part of ourselves, it becomes more and more difficult to say the words, I can't. This isn't a story about how doctors are evil, or how society is bad. This is a story about how I learned something. And I'm not saying that thing is true or not, I'm just saying it's what I learned. That people see you as they want to see you. When you look at me, what do you see? Whether you see me as an architect, an athlete, or a disability, it doesn't matter to me much anymore. The truth is, the choice is yours to make. Not your doctors, not your critics, not your disabilities. Survive or thrive, it's up to you. And I'd like to close with a message to everyone in this room who's ever been told that they can't. To everyone in this room who chooses to adapt in the face of adversity. We don't have it easy, but what we do have is guts. We know it's not the size of the achievement that matters, but it's what we've overcome to get there. We don't adapt because we have to. We adapt because we love to. And it doesn't matter what your adversity is. We thrive from different backgrounds with different adversities for different reasons, but with one thing, in common, that when we're told that we can't, we all have the same answer. Watch me. Thank you.